Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, our next round of general slot um, track talks um, for today. Now, I know there's a lot of competing uh, general talks right now, so I hope you're all super into it and feeling inundated with sweet general ideas. Um, so just to give a couple of um, reminders about uh, the session. So it's going to be a 25 minute talk with five minutes about of questions. You can ask questions either by posting in the Q&A and then I'll spotlight your question and read it out loud. Or you can raise your hands and we'll bring you on stage at the end and you can ask a question as you might in the um, in an in person conference. So feel free to use whatever way you want but if you do raise your hand you know you get to join us on the party stage so you know think about it um but without further ado i'd like to introduce our two speakers for today bradley dice and brandon butler so why don't you guys take it away cool thank you so much madigan and uh yeah it's also exciting to be here and share these these very general ideas <laughs> in the general session uh, cool. So today, um, <clears throat> Brandon and I are going to be talking about a uh, software framework that we've developed as a part of our research, um, and it's called Syniac. Um, it's it's uh, been around since about 2015, um, and uh, so yeah, Brandon and I are both researchers in Sharon Glotzer's lab at the University of Michigan. Uh, we work on material simulations and self-assembly. Um, kind of uh, cross domain between chemical engineering and physics and material science. Um, today's talk, we're focusing on uh, a handful of new features in the Syniac framework. Um, these are covered also in the SciPy Proceedings paper, which we published uh, along with the conference proceedings. And also, um, if you want to learn more about the framework, you can check out our website at syniac.io or uh, watch the past talk, which was given in 2018, introducing the framework as a whole. Um, yeah, anything else you want to add to this, Brandon? Just welcome, and we're excited to be presenting to you guys and hope you uh, looking forward to your Awesome, cool. Yeah, so uh, today we're going to go through a few different topics. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the framework a little bit, um, talk through some research applications, uh, things that people have been doing with the framework uh, since uh, the framework was published in 2018 in uh, JCMS. Uh, it's had 58 citations, so there's people from a lot of different uh, fields of research, not just uh, material science and chemical engineering, but people doing fluid dynamics and people doing quantum mechanics and all sorts of other stuff um, where they're, they're using Syniac to manage their data and automate workflows on supercomputers. Um, I'm going to talk through the design and features uh, a little bit, and um, Brandon's going to share um, uh, some of those features, as well as work that he's overseen on executing complex workflows. Um, as you may know, a lot of HPC uh, applications, we often want to run lots of different kinds of parameters or uh, very complicated uh, workflows with many stages. Uh, and the Syniac uh, framework has, has evolved to help to serve those use cases. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about synced collections, which, if you're familiar with Python's, um, uh, collections module and the abstract classes in that, you may be interested in, in this as a more general way to uh, store and retrieve data in a synchronized way. And finally, we'll close with a little bit about the project's evolution over the last three years. Um, cool. So I'll, I'll kick this off. Um, the Syniac framework, it's a lightweight application agnostic software framework. And the goal of it is to help users manage and scale file-based workflows. Um, in the space of computational sciences, we, we really want to be able to reuse one another's data. We want to be able to share data with one another. And mo perhaps most importantly for science, we want to be able to reproduce what others have done. Um, and so the, the framework is designed uh, to help people solve those problems, uh, focusing on, on a, minimal, uh, a minimal interface that allows us to make workflows that can be easily reproduced and scale to from laptops to supercomputers. Um, it's an open source package. You can install it with pip or conda. Uh, and our website has a lot more information about this kind of like installation and, and getting familiar with the framework. Um, we've been collaborating with a, a group called MOSDEF, which is the Molecular Simulation Design Framework. Um, and they, they pose this, this set of concepts called TRUE. 
um, which stands for transparent, reproducible, usable by others, and extensible. Uh, and we try really hard to embody these things in the design of the framework and how we encourage users to make use of it. Um, so this is a quote from a user who is now one of our maintainers. His name's Mike Henry. He said, uh, a great reason to use Syniac within a lab is that I needed to pull some data from a project that another grad student did. And because they use Syniac, they could use the commands uh, Syniac schema to understand the types of uh, variables that had changed across this project, whether it was like temperature or pressure. And then he could use Syniac find uh, to locate exactly the, the information and the molecular dynamics trajectories that he needed. And no one will be able to figure out what he did before he used Syniac. Uh, this is a common, a common problem in research because uh, a lot of times projects get passed down from generation to generation, from one student to another, or from a postdoc to a student, or from a student to a postdoc. Um, and oftentimes, you know, there's a significant investment that people have to make into understanding what someone did, how they organized their data, the parameters that were varied through the simulations, the parameters that were held constant, um, how the execution actually happened, whether it was on GPUs or on a multi-core processor. Um, and, and Syniac is meant to help abstract over some of those challenges uh, and make that easier for, for people to use. Um, so of the, of the 58 times that Syniac has been cited, uh, people have used it with lots of different kinds of uh, applications and high performance computing workflows. Um, quantum simulations, molecular dynamics simulations, machine learning, um, all kinds of data analysis, um, materials, property computations, uh, data visualization, and, and all of these, uh, anything that's in the Python ecosystem, you can, you can make use of with Syniac. And uh, for applications that are not in, written in Python or don't have Python interfaces, uh, you can also interact with those through um, a command line interface as well. Um, so for example, uh, this is a study that uh, was used to run five different um, uh, quantum chemistry codes on 100 different molecules. Um, and so they had a data space where they had each molecule in the Syniac project and then uh, operations that could run each of these five different codes as a method of uh, comparing the accuracy of these results. Um, this is a project that I worked on recently, um, which uh, we were kind of testing the limits of how far Syniac can scale. Um, we did photonic band calculations for over 150,000 different crystal structures. Um, and so even though Syniac is uh, based as a, it's written as a database on top of the file system, um, uh, we focus heavily on performance so that you can actually run very large uh, data spaces without needing to have a central database server, which can often be really complicated in a high performance computing setting. Um, and then finally, this is another study that was done um, by a group at Boise State where they ran uh, uh, simulations of millions of particles. Um, and because they had this uh, framework that helped them to automate those computations, they could run thousands of simulations containing these millions of particles and scale that quickly to uh, use their whole cluster at Boise State. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Brandon and Brandon's gonna talk a little bit about how the framework actually works and how uh, workflows can be implemented. Uh, thank you, Bradley. So Syniac is primarily designed around two different packages, one Syniac Core and one Syniac Flow. Syniac Core, or just Syniac for short, is designed around the I concept of a project and jobs associated with that project. And so a project, you can think about the entire work or data space that you seek to, to operate in, you wanna store data for, where a job represents a point in that data space. So if you think of the project as a set of jobs, uh, you're, not, you're not far off, although you can add jobs and, and, and remove them if you wish. Now, Syniac Flow takes it a step further and says, well, what if we wanna do things with a static static data space. Well, Syniac Flow allows you to define Python functions called operations, which take a job and operate on it and either do some sort of analysis. You could uh, run a simulation, whether that's MD or quantum. You could do some sort of machine learning application or whatever you want to do to the data space. And on the bottom here, we see this run, analyze, visualize sort of workflow. And then that just integrates directly with Syniac Core. So you have this idea of a data space that, gets, uh, that has individual points in it called jobs that get operated on by operations. 
One of the big things in in computational research, though, is being able to do this not only on your desktop or laptop, which is fairly simple, and you could just you know go on the command line and type out a few things, but also be able to do this on world class and leadership class supercomputers like TAC Stampede 2 or ORNL Summit and be able to do so easily for the user. And so we want to be able to scale to this while also preserving the ability to still run on laptops and desktops for troubleshooting and for debugging. That means we have to deal with scheduler submission, which if you've ever dealt with before, schedulers are great, but writing, uh, writing sbatch uh, batch scripts are not ex it's not exactly exciting or very fun. And so Syntax supports automatically generating and submitting these scripts to schedulers that uh, to common schedulers like Slurm, uh, PBS Torque, or LSF. It also ensures that we always submit safely, meaning you can't submit the same operation twice by accident, causing something like a race condition. Uh, that just won't happen with the with the framework. And we also support custom templates for new clusters if yours doesn't, isn't already automatically supported. And a lot of times, this ED's custom templates may need two lines of code to work with your local cluster's uh, Slurm scheduler. So typically, it's not a very tedious task. On the right, you can see an example of an auto-generated script that Synyak produces. And you don't have to write any of it. That being said, we're going to move slightly into the feature set now since our last talk. So since our last talk, we've developed a lot of features. I'm not going to go over them individually. You can look at these. They're mostly self-explanatory, to some, uh, and they're almost all documented on our documentation web page. However, the key philosophy behind our feature development is we don't go looking for new features, right? We use real use cases and real user feedback to decide the direction we're going to develop in, uh, whether that means making things easier for the user or making it more powerful and extensible. Uh, we base this all off of feedback from the users, which does include us, but in, we always we don't seek a problem. We're trying to solve uh, real researchers' problems. One of these is the ability to visualize your workspace in a way that's easy with a and it has a slick web interface, which is Synyak Dashboard. And Synyak Dashboard is a third package that lets you view your data space in this web interface, so you can view individual plots, individual images, videos. You can view the data associated with your job. And you can actually manually edit it if that's necessary for your workflow. So assume you ha are running a, a thousand jobs, and there are some, and you do need to actually visually check uh, maybe a plot to see if, uh, if something is nucleated. Or maybe you need to check to see the training curve for a neural network. Well, you can do this and make notes on it directly on this web page. Now I'm going to move on to executing complex workflows with Synyak Flow. And the work I'm going to or present on now is developments that extend that base workflow model I've talked about, that an operation operates on a job uh, to change the data space in some way, to natural extensions of this. And there's three main ones I'm going to talk about, which is aggregation, groups, and bundling which you might all notice are all words for grouping things together. And this comes to the naming is hard problem. So we have three orthogonal ways we allow this sort of grouping. And we had to come up with different names for them, because we need to document them, and we need users to be able to tell they're different. <laughs> so aggregation is the idea of being able to group jobs together into units that then are operated on by an operation, thus expanding what an operation can operate on. Groups on the other hand, allow you to group operations together into a single, execu uh, into a single execution environment or to just to be able to submit them together. And bundling, you can think of as bundling together execution units. So that way, if your scheduler prefers long running jobs and you only have jobs that take five minutes, Synyak Flow is still useful for you by grouping those five minute op uh, operations into one submission script that can be run in parallel if desired. So going on to groups. So groups, as I mentioned, groups group operations together in, into a single unit. And in fact, groups can uh, group together arbitrary units. So you could take, see on these right, you can take all five of these operations in 
in light blue, and you could group them together into an all group that would then, upon submission, submit a essentially all operations safely without having to worry about plot running before simulate runs or simulate running before equilibrate runs because that is handled automatically by the framework. It also lets you can create independent execution environments. So let's say you want to run on a GPU cluster and a CPU cluster or on a GPU node and a CPU node of the same cluster. Well, instead of having to manually edit which directives you want to use, you can actually just create two groups that will operate, or sorry, two, yeah, two groups that will have the same exact operations, but then have different directives associated with them. Directives being the resource request that you uh, make for an operation, allowing you to do that very easily. Now, here's an example code. On the left, you can see a Python script that would put together simulate and analyze into a, into a group called example group here. And this would let you submit example group into your cluster. And now analyze can't run until simulate has finished running. However, by doing this, you can submit both of them at the same time, ensuring that if somehow simulate doesn't finish or something goes wrong, that you won't accidentally analyze or try to run that, ensuring that the workflow stays airtight. On the right, you can see a submission script that is generated automatically using groups. So groups natively support submission. There's no, nothing that a user needs to think about here in using groups. Aggregation is another use case. So there are two main types of aggregation that is, we see, although there are potentially others that we do support. So you can group by key. So let's say you want to group by temperature or pressure, or you want to group uh, across replicas. So you have to group by everything besides replicas. Well, this lets you be able to do so natively and be able to do statistical analysis uh, or be able to plot things across temperature if you wish. On the other hand, you can group by, yeah, dual presenting can be a little hard, right? You can group, <laughs> by, uh, you can group by number. And in that case, that lets you do things like custom parallelization. So let's say you want to have a very granular control about how you uh, assign MPI ranks, or you want to do some other sort of custom parallelization across nodes or within a node. Well, grouping by number, if you operate on a number of jobs together, this lets you do so manually if you need that sort of granularity. And this is actually necessary for some leadership class machines, uh, such as Summit. And here's another code snippet on the left. We see the Python code that creates aggregation. Excuse me, both kinds actually. On the top, we can see uh, groups of, which lets us group together just arbitrary uh, numbers of uh, a specific number of jobs, in this case, right, to do some sort of custom parallelization that's not supported by Syniac flow by default. On the bottom, we can see we're grouping by temperature and pressure and assuming that's our only two fluctuating variables besides replicas. This will aggregate across uh, the replicas of a given, given state point, allowing you to do the appropriate statistical analysis that you need to. And it's going to be useful for a variety of workflows. On the right, we see once again, Aggregation just works with submission. You don't have to think about it beyond setting it up with these two or three lines of code on the left. Cool. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about another feature that we've recently added to the core package, uh, which is called synced collections. Um, so uh, many Python users, you're probably familiar with uh, built-in data structures of list and dict. Um, so a lot of the, how the choices of how these are implemented affect how we solve problems in the language. Um, if you look at the abstract classes in the collections.abc module, um, there's these uh, sort of prototypes, these uh, mutable sequence and mutable mapping classes that convey uh, that these act like lists or dicts, um, at least to, to first order. <laughs> um, and so you could create a class that uh, acts like a mutable mapping or a mutable sequence that is uh, synchronized to a file on, on disk. And this is how Syniac has traditionally worked. Um, the job state points and job documents um, that store parameters about those jobs are, are uh, written in this way. And so if a user modifies a job in the Python interface, it gets saved back to disk. Um, but this doesn't necessarily uh, work very well if we wanted to have a more flexible set of backends. If we wanted to be able to do things like synchronizing Syniac data with a SQL database, for example, um, you, you end up having to create lots of different classes that act in this loading and saving manner. 
Um, so we've introduced a, a sub package called Synced Collections. Um, it allows the synchronization of data with arbitrary resources and backends. Um, and it unifies the implementations of lazy loading, buffering, thread safety, data validation, uh, problems that are often very difficult to deal with and require a lot of manual implementation. Uh, because Synyak is, is a database, uh, we try to minimize I.O. Um, and the constraints of each backend for a synced collection can vary. Um, you have about five so, minutes left, by the way. Great. Thanks, Madigan. Yep. Um, so the way that this works is that we inherit from these collections and, and list-like and dict-like classes um, with a synced collection that handles synchronization logic. Then for, for a user to implement a backend or for a backend to be implemented on, for the benefit of other users, um, you only have to really implement load and save methods on, this, on a uh, backend collection class. Here, for example, we're using a JSON collection. And then uh, through, the, through the implementation of the synced collection and synced list and JSON collection classes, uh, we get basically trivial subclasses that encapsulate all of those behaviors and act like a list that synchronizes this data to a JSON file or a dictionary that does the same. Um, and so this, this encapsulates a lot of the potential difficulties with, uh, with backends and with loading and saving data error handling and things like that can all be uh, abstracted into the synced collections framework. Um, so some of the backends that we support are JSON, Redis caches, czar archives, um, MongoDB documents, but there's really no limits to what can be done. You can use uh, data on disk, data in memory, whether it's in Python, or you could potentially link to uh, a C++ uh, standard vector or unordered map through a tool like PyBind11 or Cython. Um, and so uh, this is going to enable us to eventually extend the backend support for Cineac's serverless design that uses the file system and JSON files uh, into something that could scale up to uh, a larger number of jobs um, through a centralized database. Um, yeah, so we're going to conclude with just a little bit more information about the the project and its evolution over time. Uh, Brandon, do you want to do you want to talk through this quickly? Yep, I, I got this. So. We've grown a lot since uh, five years ago. Um, in fact, we have over 200,000 uh, 200, downloads of Syniac, Syniac Flow Conda packages, which is about 1% of uh, NumPy. So that goes to show you how, how big NumPy is. I, I think we're doing 1% of, of, of NumPy. We're doing pretty well. We've had two Google Summer of Code students in 2020. We currently have eight maintainers slash committers, and we are in three different continents. We're used by research groups across the world. And we are actively used on projects with over 100,000 jobs and that use terabytes of data. So here you can see the Synyak team, all the maintainers and committers. And in the scene, as you might wonder what a committer is. And so as we've grown, we've realized we need a more standardized uh, governance philosophy slash document. Uh, and in doing so, we've created this uh, four uh, pillar system where we have maintainers, committers, contributors, and users. And in doing so, we've uh, gained new people who are deeply invested into the project, like Hardik, which you can see on the on the bottom left, who was actually our one of our Google of Summer of Code students, who is now a committer and active, very active in our project. Here are uh, the screenshots and links to our website, our documentation, and our Slack support channel, which we welcome you to join if you decide to use our framework, which we, we hope you do. And thank you. Here are our acknowledgments and a, a variety of logos of our funding sources. We are also a NumFocused affiliated project. You can see that on the bottom right. And, and here's a picture of the group where Sunyat got started, plus our SciPy talk on the top right. Thank you for listening. We'll take any questions now. Let's all um, clap for our speakers. Thank you for the great talk, both of you. That was excellent. Um, OK, let's get straight into questions. So um, our first uh, question is from Matthew Epperson. Could you elaborate on the decisions leading to write your own workflow management tool? Also, are you involved already in the Workflows Community Summit? Uh, yeah. So. Um, I think uh, when the Syniac project began in 2015, um, I think that uh, it started largely as a data management framework. Um, and the workflows that we needed 
largely revolved around file-based HPC workflows. Um, I see that there's someone else who's also asked a somewhat related question of how, how this compares to something like Apache Airflow. Um, I think like the, the use cases for Syniac, uh, we really focus on use cases where we want to be um, like a minimal prototype. So often in research, you have questions that change, data schemas that change, uh, underlying hardware resources that are constantly evolving as, as new supercomputers are used. Um, and I think that uh, basically the, the design of Syniac is largely driven around trying to minimize uh, the amount of interaction that is needed on behalf of the user to set up these workflows and uh, have centralized databases and things like that. Um, you mentioned a, a workflows summit. I'm not familiar with this. I'd be happy to uh, please share a link on Slack. Yeah, Matthew, um, feel free to share it in the chat here also. Um, and definitely the SciPy Slack. I think that's going to be of interest to more than uh, just our great speakers here, but uh, probably a lot of people in the community. Yeah, and just to to elaborate, so like we said, Sinyak is five years old. And a lot of packages that are now focused on submitting uh, in the scheduler kind of environment uh, actually came around at the same time or afterwards. So, so we weren't exactly reinventing the wheel there. Plus, a lot of the workflow management tools that operate with databases right, require homogeneity in the data space. And that's just not something that's feasible, on early, especially on early stages of a project, for, for many computational researchers who go to their advisor and realize they have to test a whole new set of variables. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well. Um... I don't see any more questions. We can uh, just chat here for a little bit. But thank you again to both of you for the great talk. Um, also, it's amazing that you have as many downloads as you do, given the age of your project. I mean, I would consider it still quite young. Um, and that's amazing. Great job. And uh, you know, great job building up your community. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, we help people all the time on our Slack channels, and uh, we have weekly office hours that people stop into. Today, we had two two folks that I haven't met before, really, that uh, mm -hmm. came through and had, you know, they put their questions on PowerPoint slides. I was like, wow, you guys are, like, invested. On top like, of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really so, impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That's so great. It, was, it was really cool. Yeah. Um, well, um, I yeah maybe next year SciPy will have to talk more about uh, community building with these tools and stuff you know. Um, if there but, only um, existed a forum to do that. Yeah. Um. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think we can end a little early, um, and I encourage everybody in the audience to go to one of the next three talks, um, which are all in the general session. So you won't miss out on the general session if you go to a talk um, for the next thirty minutes. Uh, so. Uh, hopefully see some of you there and if not um see you in the gather time a little bit later or for like Great. talks okay thanks again medican yep thanks. and uh yeah feel free to reach out on our website or slack if you have other questions yep. all right take care